So, um, good evening everyone and a very warm welcome to Bedtime Stories brought to you by the fabulous Architecture Foundation. I'm Leslie Loco and I'm reading to you this evening from New York where it's still the middle of the afternoon. I read somewhere back in March, which now seems like a lifetime ago, that COVID-19 has turned the words, I hope you're safe and well, into the world's most popular greeting. It's a bit of an improvement on the way the mobile replaced how are you with where are you, but I do hope that everyone listening is safe and well wherever you are. First of all, I'd like to thank Alicia and Rosie for inviting me to read a bedtime story. My niece, who's in her early 20s, is probably the last person I read a bedtime story to, and that was about 20 years ago, so I'm a little out of practice. Tonight I've chosen an author and a story that I've gone back to many times over the past 20 years, partly out of the sheer pleasure of his writing, but also because distance, time and geography have become so blurred. I arrived in New York in December last year, and the first confirmed case was on the 1st of March. So today is actually the 121st day since the word pandemic began to take on personal meaning. Most of my time here has been spent in lockdown, so I'm not actually sure where I am in the city. I have very little sense of New York beyond my apartment. At least I have no nostalgia for the city before COVID. Lockdown is pretty much all I know of it. Directly in front of my window is a very large tree that blots out everything, especially now in summer. So I found myself drawn to texts over the past couple of months that describe a world very far removed from the one I'm experiencing, especially when Trump drifts into view, probably subconsciously as a way to gain a bit of perspective through the lens of historical and geographical distance. Tonight's story is by the Australian writer David Malouf from his 1993 novel, Remembering Babylon. I re first read it in 1994 at the end of my first year of diploma at the Bartlett, when you're in that kind of intense fog that only diploma can produce. Partly because of that time, it's a novel that has always been fused with my lifelong attempt, and some might say obsession, to include race as a meaningful category in the study of architecture and the built environment. I must have read it 50, 60 times since then, always finding something newly significant in each rereading, making it one of those personal texts for life, which are both rare and incredibly precious. Reading it now against the backdrop of the anti-racism protests that have swept around the world in the past month, which in the US at least are inextricable from COVID, is quite strange. There's a sense of deja vu, of course, but there's also a sense of surprise that it's taken so long for the issues to move from a marginal niche complaint to something that is right at the heart of society, or at least it should be. And yet there's also a sense of unease that the space that's finally been opened up will soon close without leaving anything more meaningful than corporate statements behind. So it is a strange time. And Malouf's novel is all about strangeness. It's about the slippages in identity and language, about the place and space of the in-between, the estrangement of the hybrid, the person who is neither one thing nor another, and the terror that such a figure provokes. It's about the slippery, complex, and yet profound relationship between race, place, and culture, between here and there, particularly out there in this novel, beyond the reach and knowledge, or ken, as the Scots might say, of the white settler. And although remembering Babylon is fictional, the character of the hybrid, Jemmy Fairley, is loosely based upon a real figure, James Morrill. Around the same time the novel takes place in the mid 1800s, Morrill was shipwrecked off the coast of Australia and came to live with a group of Aboriginal Australians, completely adopting their language and customs for 17 years. When he eventually rejoins a white settlement, he utters the same words that Jemmy Fairley does. I'm going to read three excerpts, one which opens the novel, a second which occurs a few pages in, and then one about halfway through the book, close to the end. So let's start. One day, in the middle of the 19th century, 
when settlement in Queensland had advanced little more than halfway up the coast. Three children were playing at the edge of a paddock when they saw something extraordinary. They were two little girls in patched gingham and a boy, their cousin, in short pants and braces, all three barefooted farm children, not easily scared. They had little opportunity for play, but had been engaged for the past hour in a game of the boys devising. The paddock, all clay-packed stones and ant trails, was a forest in Russia, and they were hunters on the tracks of wolves. The boy had elaborated this scrap of make-believe out of a story in the fourth grade reader, and he was lost in it. Cold air burned his nostrils, snow squeaked underfoot. The gun he carried, a good-sized stick, hung heavy on his arm. But the girls, especially Janet, who was older than he was and half a head taller, were bored. They had no experience of snow, and wolves did not interest them. They complained and dawdled, and he had to exert, exert all his gift for fantasy, his will too, which was stubborn, to keep them in the game. They had a blue kelpie with them. He bounced along with his tongue out, excited by the boy's solemn concentration, but puzzled too that he could get no sense of what they were after. The idea of wolf had not been transmitted to him. He danced around the little party, sometimes in front, sometimes to the side, sniffing close to the earth, raising his eyes in hope of instruction, and every now and then, since he was young and easily distracted, bounding away after the clippered insects, that sprang up as they approached, or a grasshopper that rose with a ponderous whirring and rolled sideways from his jaws. Then suddenly he did get the scent. With a yelp of pure delight, he shot off in the direction of their boundary fence, and the children, all three, turned to see what he had found. Lachlan Beatty felt the snow melt at his feet. He heard a faint, far-off rushing like wind rolling down a tunnel, and it took him a moment to understand that it was coming from inside him. In the intense heat that made everything you looked at warp and glare, a fragment of a tea tree swamp, some bit of the land over there that was forbidden to them, had detached itself from the band of grey that made up the far side of the swamp. And in a shape more like a watery, heat-struck mirage than a thing of substance, elongated and airily indistinct, was bowling, leaping, flying towards them. A black, that was the boy's first thought. We're being raided by blacks. After so many false alarms, it had come. The two girls stood spellbound. They had given a gasp, one short intake of breath and then forgotten to breathe out. The boy too was struck, but he'd begun to recover. Though he was very pale about the mouth, he did what his manhood required him to do. Holding fast to the stick, he stepped resolutely in front. But it wasn't a raid. There was just one of them. And the thing, as far as he could make out through the sweat in his eyes and its flame-like flickering, was not even maybe human. The stick-like legs, all knobbled at the joints, suggested a wounded water bird a brolga or a human that in the manner of the tales they told one another, all spells and curses, had been changed into a bird, but only halfway, and now, neither one thing nor the other, was hopping and flapping towards them out of a world over there, beyond the no man's land of the swamp that was the abode of everything savage and fearsome. And since it lay so far beyond experience, not just their own, but their parents too, of nightmare rumours, superstitions, and all that belonged to the absolute dark. A bit of blue rag was at its middle, from which sleeves hung down. They swung and signalled. But the sticks of arms above its head were also signalling, signalling or beating off flies, or licks of invisible flame. Ah, that was it. It was a scarecrow that had somehow caught the spark of life, got down from its pole, and now in a raggedy, rough-headed way, was stumbling about over the blazing earth, its leathery face scorched black, but with hair they saw, as it bore down upon them, a sun-bleached and pale straw-coloured as their own. Whatever it was, it was the boy's intention to confront it. Very sturdy and purposeful, two paces in front of his cousins, 
though it might have been a hundred yards in the tremendous isolation he felt, and with a belief in the power of the weapon that he knew he held was impossible and might not endure, he pushed the stick into his shoulder and took his stance. The creature, almost upon them now, and with flash at its heels, came to a halt, gave a kind of squawk, and leaping up onto the top rail of the fence, hung there, its arms outflung as if preparing for flight. Then the ragged mouth opened. Do not shoot, it shouted. I am a b -b 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 British object. That's the end of the first excerpt. Here's the second one. The country he had broken out of was all unknown to them. Even in full sunlight, it was impenetrably dark. To the north, beginning with the last fenced paddock, lay swamp country, bird-haunted marshes. Then, where the great spine of the dividing range rose in ridges and shoals of mist, rainforest broken by sluggish streams. The land to the south was also unknown. Settlement up here proceeded in frog leaps from one little coastal place to the next. Between lay tracts of country that no white man had ever entered. It was disturbing that, to have unknown country behind you as well as in front. When the hissing of the lamp died out, the hut sank into silence. A child's murmuring out of sleep might keep it human for a moment or a rustling of straw. But what you were left with when the last sleeper settled was the unlimitable night where it lay close over the land. You lay listening to the crash of animals through its underbrush, the crack like a snapped bone of a ring-barked tree out in a paddock and then its muffled fall, or some other unidentifiable sound loud, louder further off that was an event in the land's history but no part of yours. The sense then of being submerged, of being hidden away in the depths of the country, but also lost, was very strong. In all their lives until they came here, they had never ventured, most of them, out of sight or earshot of a village steeple, that as they stooped to carry stooks and lean them one against the other, was always there when they looked up, breaking the horizon beyond the crest of a rise or across open fields. Out here, the very ground under their feet was strange. It had never been ploughed. You had to learn all over again how to deal with weather, drenching downpours, when in moments all the topsoil you had exposed went liquid and all the dry little creek beds in the vicinity ran wild. Cyclones that could wrench whole trees up by their roots and send a shed too lightly anchored sailing clear through the air with all its corrugated iron sheets collapsing inward and slicing and singing in the wind. And all around, before and behind, worse than weather and the deepest night, tribes of wandering miles who in their traipsing this way and that all over the map were forever encroaching on boundaries that could be insisted upon by daylight, a good shotgun saw to that, but in the dark hours when you no longer stood there as a living marker, with all the glow of the white man's authority around you, reverted to being a creek bed or a ridge of granite like any other and gave no indication that 600 miles away in the lands office in Brisbane, this bit of country had a name set against it on a numbered document and a line drawn that was empowered with all the authority of the law. Most unnerving of all was the knowledge that just three years back, the very patch of earth you were standing on had itself been on the other side of things, part of the unknown, and might still for all your coming and going over it and the sweat you poured into its acre or two of ploughed earth have the last mystery upon it, in breaks between paddocks and ferny places out of the sun. Good reason that for stripping it as soon as you could manage of every vestige of the native, for ring barking and clearing and reducing it to what would make it at last just like home. It was from this standpoint that the little crowd of settlers drawn together in such an unusual manner at this time of day, faced the black white man the children had brought in. And now I'm going to read something from the end of the novel, spoken by the same Janet, who's now a woman in her 60s. 
When she glances up again, for she has been dozing, the misty blue out there has become indigo. The first lights have been doused, though the houses themselves do not fade from her mind or the children who are sleeping in them. The first bright line of moonlight has appeared out on the mud flats, marking the ever moving, ever approaching, ever receding shore. All this a kind of praying. It does not make a house any less vivid out there because she can no longer see its light, or the children any less close because they no longer come to visit, or Willie because she has never known him except for what she has felt in Lachlan and through him in herself, the wedge of apple in his mouth, or her mother long gone, standing out on the hill slope in the dark, the dark of her body solid through the flimsy stuff, the moonlight of her shift, or her father slumped at the breakfast table the loose skin of her mother's hand like an old glove on the leathery back of his neck. Or in the darkness now on the other side of the house, the single mind of the beehive closed on itself on its secret, which her own mind approaches and draws back from, the moment of illumination when she will again be filled with it, and Mrs Hutchins who has led her to this, and always in a stilled moment that has lasted for years, Jemmy Fairley as she saw him, once and for all, up there on the shiny and stripped rail, never to fall, and Flash slicing the air with his yelps and clear dog language, and his arms flung out, never to lift him clear. Overbalancing now, drawn by the power, all unconscious in them, of their gaze, their need to draw him into their lives, love, again love, overbalanced, but not yet falling. Let none be left out in the dark or out of mind on this night now, in this corner of the world or any other, at this hour, in the middle of this war. Out beyond the flatlands, the line of light pulses and swells. The sea, in sight now, ruffles and accelerates. Quickly now it is rising towards us, it approaches. As we approach prayer, as we approach knowledge, as we approach one another. It glows in fullness till the tide is high and the light almost, but not quite unbearable as the moon plucks at our world and all the waters of the earth ache towards it. And the light running in fast now reaches the ed edges of the shore just so far in its order and all the muddy margin of the bay is alive. And in a line of running fire, all the outline of the vast continent appears in touch now with its other life. So that's at the end of the novel. And I just want to read something very, very short, which occurs right at the end, which is a note from the author. And the words that Jemmy shouts at the fence in chapter one, the seed of this fiction, were actually spoken at much the same time and place, but in different circumstances by Jim or Jemmy Morrill, whose Christian name I have also appropriated. Otherwise, this novel has no origin in fact. F.T. Gregory wrote a brief account of Morrill's life from which I have taken the three descriptions of local flora at the beginning of chapter 14. And the letters in Bruce Knox's Robert Herbert provided some of the detail for chapter 18. So that's the end of today's um, bedtime reading. I hope you enjoyed it. This being the first bedtime reading I've done, I'm not sure if um, I'm supposed to answer any questions, but um, this book really for me has been a lifelong companion and a really meaningful discourse on, on what it means to be both and. So thank you.